<laughs> you like that, huh? You all heard her holler, Dad, you. That's her word for water. So when she hollers, Dad, you, she wants some water. So here's some water. Want some more? Okay. She's going to do that right now. If you'll all stand. What? No flag? We'll all pretend that there's a flag right over here in this corner, and Pooh can lead us in the pledge. Wait a minute. She wanted to do this, and I promised she could, and some, a lot of you have asked if she could do it. Okay, it's all up to you. I pledge, pledge allegiance to, to the, the flag of, of the United States, States of America, America and, and to the republic for which it stands, stands one nation under, under God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty and justice, justice for all. all. <laughs> Thank you, baby. You want to say something? <laughs> she wants to eat it. <laughs> okay. Take Allie, go back and play. Thank you, honey. The children are the are the future of this world. They're the future of this nation. They're, they're, they are all that is important. We've all had our chance. We've screwed up our lives. We've screwed up the country. We've screwed up the world. Let's teach our children the right things and give them the, the, the opportunity to do the things that we should have done a long time ago. And let's do all we can in the meantime to make sure that they can have a free future with all the opportunity and, and benefits that we screwed up. And the truth is, is, is that we really screwed it up. And if we're not careful, we're going to leave them to be slaves in a socialist world that they're not going to be happy in. But they won't know that they're not happy because they will be brainwashed and taught that that's the way it's supposed to be and there isn't anything else. And the record of freedom will just be simply removed from history. Will be taken out and thrown away. And we don't want that. <laughs> She's very assertive. Pooh, why don't you just go over there by mom? She'll follow you. She's okay. Go to mommy, honey. That's a good girl. Thank you. See how easy it is? <laughs> You can't force somebody to do something they don't want to do. But if you ask them politely, they might do it. Okay. Let's get back to the subject at hand. Militias. <laughs> Militias are absolutely necessary to a free people. The Founding Fathers knew this. They couldn't ignore it even if they wanted to because the people knew it. Who was it that stopped the Redcoats when they went to seize the arms at Lexington? The militia. The militia. How were they described by the British commander? <laughs> we marched to the bridge and were met by a group of farmers with guns who drew up in a somewhat military order and opposed us. That's how they were described. They weren't military people. They were farmers who had guns and who said, uh -uh. nope, I don't care who sent you, King George, or it doesn't matter. You're not taking our guns because we know that if we give up our guns, we are no longer a free people. What is so hard to understand about that? I can't figure it out, folks that all of these people actually believe that they can allow themselves to be disarmed and they're going to stay free. 
They can fall, fall for all these scams and phony statistics and everything that are lies about guns and how many children are killed with guns and how many guns are used in, uh, and it's always automatic weapons, and, and they never are. They never are automatic weapons, but they are in the press. How many of you own uh, guns? Good for you. I personally believe that it's the duty of every American to own guns. The duty. See, I take it beyond right. I say it's a duty to maintain freedom. We must own guns, therefore it's a duty. If you don't own guns, you're not fulfilling your duty. You're letting yourself and your community down. In the face of all the propaganda and opposition and everything else, you must own guns. You must. It is a duty. You must learn how to use them, take care of them. You must teach your children how to be safe around them, how to use them, how to take care of them, when to touch them, when not to touch them. Make sure that they know. Like I teach my family. You don't ever point a gun at anyone unless you intend to kill them. And if you intend to kill them, do it. Don't hesitate. Because if you do, they'll kill you. It's that simple. Don't ever pick up a gun unless you intend to use it. If you use it, use it in a safe, secure manner, like I taught you. Don't ever point a gun at another human being or an animal or anything that lives unless you intend to kill it and if you intend to kill it do it don't hesitate so don't mess with my wife <laughs> she'll kill you and I'm not joking when we were broadcasting from Waco Texas we went to the little place on the hill where you could see the Branch Davidian church down there burning and they had all these hawkers there with the uh, Jesus lives with a picture of uh, David Koresh and uh, welcome to our Texas barbecue with a picture of the church burning BATF bought a lot of those and I was taking pictures of these two BATF guys buying these t-shirts and one of them saw me and he turned around and he walked toward me real fast and he pulled his weapon halfway out of his holster and he came over to me and he said give me that camera and I said no he said give me the camera or I'll be forced to take it I said no I'm protected by the first article and amendment I'm a member of the press and I showed him my press credentials and I said even if I wasn't you wouldn't get my camera you have no right to take my camera he said well then give me the film I said I'm not going to give you the film either and by that time, everybody's looking, and some people are starting to come over. And I turned around, and there was Annie standing there with her hand in her purse. <laughs> and if he'd have touched me, she would have blown him right off the face of this earth so quick, you wouldn't even believe it. And that scared the hell out of me. <laughs> so... <clears throat> We have to have militia, and militia is everybody who's capable of functioning in some capacity as a militiaman. And that includes, in my estimation, men and women, although the law only specifies men, and has always only specifies men. We have traditionally in this country allowed women to serve in any capacity that they wish to volunteer to serve in, including serving as crew members of weapons. One famous incident in the Civil War. A woman whose husband was an artilleryman. She was pregnant, almost ready to give birth. He was killed at one of the battles in the Civil War. She immediately rushed up, grabbed the swab that he used to clean the cannon, or to swab the cannon with water after it had been fired, and took his place. I met Linda Thompson in Waco, Texas. While I was covering the event by broadcasting from Waco, Texas, she was trying to muster a militia to stop what we all knew was going to happen. I saw her in a parking lot holding an AR-15 above her head, dressed in fatigues, trying to muster a militia. She got about 20 guys together, 
started marching down toward the toward the uh, the uh, place where this confrontation was taken. I get all emotional when I even think about this, so you'll have to forgive me. And uh, they were quickly surrounded and disarmed and hauled off. But she tried. She tried. Nobody else tried. Linda tried. And she's been uh, just raked over the coals ever since by everybody, except for me. I think Linda Thompson has more balls than most men in this country have ever had or ever will have. And she stood up for the nation when nobody else would. So I support her and always will. If it wasn't for her tape, Waco the Big Lie, there would never have been any congressional investigations and most of the country would still be saying, oh, they're a bunch of religious fanatics. They deserved exactly what they got. So in my estimation, anybody that talks bad about Linda Thompson is a very bad person. Linda Thompson was the militia. Who can call up the militia? Traditionally in this country, any responsible person could call forth the militia for any responsible reason. It's still that way today. Is the National Guard the militia? Well, now you're wrong. It is the militia of the United States. You see, the California National Guard cannot ever be the militia of California. Why? Because it violates all the rules. It can be federalized and therefore could never stand in defense of the state against a central government turned despotic or tyrannical. Therefore, the National Guard cannot be the militia. It also violates the other rules. Who trains the officers of the National Guard? The regular army. The United States trains those officers. To be militia, the officers must be trained by the state, don't they? Okay, so the National Guard is not the militia of the states. It is the militia of the United States. That's true. There's also another militia of the United States. It's the unorganized militia of the United States of America. And who is that? It's everybody between the ages of 17 and 45 who are capable of serving in the capacity of a militiaman. The law specifically says men and boys. Who cannot be in the unorganized militia of the United States of America? The vice president, the, vice president, the president, any elected officer cannot be a member. The National, Guard. National Guard cannot be a member. Any member of the military forces of the United States of America cannot be a member of the militia. Why? Because they're under control of the very people who could subvert the government and become a tyrant to the people, aren't they? And the purpose of the militia is to prevent that. The militia has three functions. What are they? Who can name them off? There's only three. Nobody. Repel invasion. Suppress insurrection and enforce the laws of the Union. Actually, it says execute the laws of the Union. Repel invasion, suppress insurrection, and execute the laws of the Union. Why does it say execute the laws of the Union instead of obey the President? If the President tears up the Constitution and becomes a tyrant, it's up to the militia to enforce the laws of the Union and arrest the President, isn't it? That's the function of the militia. The same in the state. 
any state, the function of the militia is to repel invasion, suppress insurrection, execute the laws of the state, and any other constitutional lawful purpose to which the governor may call them up to perform. <coughs> what is a lawful militia? Can you put together a bunch of guys and say we're the militia? Can you? The white shirt? Yeah. That's right. But, do you have to say they're the militia? They're already the militia. You are the militia. You don't even have to get together. You're the militia. You can get together with anybody else in here who is the militia, or who wants to volunteer to be a member of the militia, and you can form a unit of the unorganized militia of the state of California, or if the Constitution of the state of California specifies it, the constitutional militia of the state of California, like they do in Texas, the constitutional militia of Texas, okay? And you can get together and you can have meetings and you can train and you can prepare to function as militiamen. Is this lawful? Absolutely. Absolutely. And there's nobody who can do anything to stop you. Period. Can you appoint yourself colonel and become commander of the militia? Why not? In the absence of appointment of rank by the governor of your state, officers must be elected by the militia. So you elect your officers. You cannot appoint yourself, and nobody can appoint you. The militia elects the officers, and they're elected to serve in those capacities for certain periods of time. Now, if in your capacity, as elected officer in the militia, whatever your rank may be, during a lawful, organized training exercise, you give an order which somebody disobeys, can they be punished? Not only can be, must be. Must be. If you don't, what do you have? You have anarchy, you don't have a militia. And the first time you go into battle, you're going to have people doing what they want to do instead of what they have to do to win that battle, don't you? So it's not can, but must be. Must be in every instance. When they elect you to be an officer and your order was lawful and right under the circumstances, they must obey that order. If they don't, you must have some system set up to punish that member or expel that member from the militia body. What body of rules governors, governs the militia? Uniform Code of Military Justice. And every lawfully formed militia must have a copy of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. And everybody must understand how it operates and what they're subject to. Must militia members be under oath? Must they be under oath? Absolutely. If they cannot take an oath of loyalty to the Constitution of the United States of America and of their state, how can you trust them? How can you trust them? The answer is you cannot. Can you substitute an affirmation for an oath? No. Yes, you can. An affirmation is as legally binding as an oath. It's the truth. If somebody says, I can't take an oath on religious grounds, can you accept them? Huh? You can take them if they agree to take an affirmation. If they refuse to take the affirmation on religious grounds, can you accept them? No! The militia is not a religious organization. 
It's a military organization, and you must be able to trust the members of the militia. And if they cannot be under oath or affirmation, you cannot trust them. You cannot accept them. You cannot have them in your organization. Period. Cut and dried, no. Cannot. Can you accept a convicted felon in a militia organization? No, why not? Bad character? What if he paid for his crime and he's never done anything bad again? He can't own a weapon. Now there's two things, there's two reasons why you can't do this. Number one, he cannot own or be in possession of a weapon. So you're jeopardizing this person's life if you let them come around weapons and they're seen or a photograph is taken with them just touching a weapon. They could go back to prison and you don't want that to happen to them. Okay? Aside from the fact that they can't own a weapon, can't use a weapon, touch a weapon, or hold a weapon, which means they have to function in some administrative capacity, there is a liability propaganda-wise. If the press finds out you have convicted felons in your militia, what are they going to do to you? They're going to rake you over the coals and you don't need that. So what you do is you put these people in reserve. And you say, you are not an active part of this militia. You are, by law of the land, a member of the militia, though you can't take part in our unit. If war breaks out, you come running and we'll give you a gun, because then it won't matter whether you have a gun or not. Right? That's how you treat those people. Don't make them feel bad because they committed a crime or did something wrong in their life and, and paid the price for it. Because I can assure you, everybody in this room has done something wrong at some point in their life. <coughs> Most of us have determined we're not going to do it again. They got caught. We didn't. Now, if you're an exception to that rule, you are really an exception, I've got to tell you. Because everybody is human, and everybody sometime during their life does something wrong. Usually when you're younger, and crazier, and wilder, and stupider. And if you're lucky, you get away with it. Some people aren't so lucky. So let's not be hard on those people. And some of them are really good people, and really have turned their lives around. And really do want to participate and help. And it hurts to say no to them, but you have to. What kind of exercises can you do with a militia? No. You can have any kind of militia you want to. As long as you state it, that you are that type of militia and that you have certain goals and purposes in your training exercises. You can have a militia of artillery. Did you know that? You can have a militia of armor. You can have a transportation company or battalion. You can be a militia company or battalion or even regiment. You can be an air force. Second Continental Army of the Republic has an Air Force. Didn't know that, did you? We also have jet fighters. Didn't know that either, did you? But I won't tell you where. <laughs> or who flies them. I will tell you that we have them. No, we don't have an A-10. <laughs> we do have a few MiGs. <laughs> we don't have any of those. No, no. You can have any kind of militia that you want. As long as it is for a legitimate military purpose, and that it's spelled, you can't change yourself 
from infantry to armor to artillery every three weeks. You have to establish the unit as a specific type of unit and equip and train for that mission. You have to do that. Now I see a lot of people shaking their heads when I say you can be an artillery unit. It happens to be the truth. The Supreme Court has ruled on it. Anybody know the case? The case was where a guy was arrested for having a shotgun parading around in public with it and he took it all the way to the Supreme Court saying that he, he was uh, legally authorized to own that gun and, and that they couldn't take it away from him because he was in the militia. And the Supreme Court ruled that the shotgun was not a weapon of the militia and that he was authorized to have, possess, use, and train with any weapon that is a proper weapon for a militia, including artillery for an artillery unit, armor for an armor unit, rifles for a infantry unit, etc. Didn't know that, did you? <laughs> you gotta read the law, folks. You gotta study the law. The militia is iron-bound in this country. Do you really believe in your wildest dreams there would be any militia in this country if it was illegal? They would have come after us a long, long time ago, not just vilify us in the press. That's to try to discredit us in the eyes of the sheeple for the day when the fighting starts so that we won't have any popular support. That's really what that's all about. You see, because if the militia was unlawful, unconstitutional, and we were doing something wrong, they would have come after us a long time ago. And you're right. The war would have started then. So you see, there is a legal militia. There's a lawful militia. There's a constitutional militia. Most of the militias that you see in the public eye are not legitimate, lawful militias. Is a militia that says only Christians can belong to this militia and we're going to call ourselves the 4th uh, Missouri Volunteer Christian Militia. Is that a militia? No, it's a religious army made up of religious members of some particular sect of Christianity as a whole. And if you don't believe in what they believe in, you'll all end up fighting them. Okay? A militia is a military organization, not a religious organization, and don't ever get the two confused. You can't go to a militia meeting and turn it into a prayer meeting. And you can't go to a prayer meeting and after you get through with the sermon, have a militia meeting. Cannot do it. You can go to a militia meeting and you can have a chaplain and you can ask the chaplain to say a prayer and that's okay. But if you have one Jewish guy that doesn't like that and he wants to say a Jewish prayer, you better let him. You better let him or you're not a militia. Understand that. Militia is to protect our freedom so that we can worship at the altar of our choice. It is not to dictate to us which religion or altar we're to worship at or to say who can be a member of the militia based upon what their religious preference is. And anytime we get away from that, we are destroying freedom for all of us. Understand this and understand it clearly. If I take away your freedom, I have taken away the freedom of everyone in this room. Everyone. And everyone who allows me to do it is complicit in that treason. Take away the rights of one, you have taken away the rights of all. The instant that it's done. And anyone who condones it or allows it is complicit in the treason. And it is treason in this country. Now we must have militias. If you don't belong to a militia, you need to join one. If you don't know where a militia is that you can join, form one. 
advertise. You cannot do it in secret, you must do it in public. You do not have to have all of your activities publicly known, but you must be public. You must never talk to the press under any circumstances whatsoever, period, except when authorized by the commanding officer to issue a statement that has been pre-prepared to be delivered by the officer who has been appointed to be the public affairs officer and he is to make no statement, answer no questions, only read what he has been given to read and then shut his stupid mouth. Now you've seen a lot of people across this country pretend to be militia. I've only seen one that was legitimate and that was Norman Olson. He was the legitimate commander of the, Michigan, of the uh, militia of Michigan. He was not a good choice, even though he meant well. He was a preacher of a church who got religion and militia and all kinds of things confused. He didn't understand the law. Whenever he confronted the press, he said all the wrong things instead of what he should have said. And so he caused the militia of Montana a lot of embarrassment and, by association, all of the militias in the country. But Norm Olson is a good man, and he meant well, and he should not be castigated or thrown out or, or vilified or anything. He was trying to do his best. The militia of Montana is a joke. Always has been. The militia of Montana has never been anyone other than John Trockman and about four or five other people in a little room full of all the stuff that they sell. Period. That's it. When they went to Congress, they made a joke out of the militia. Instead of addressing the issues that they should have addressed and talking about the things they should have talked about and quoting the law to legitimize to the nation and to Congress, the militia. What did they talk about? The government's manipulating the weather. We're all gonna drown in a rainstorm. Hurricanes and rah, 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 rah. What did they look like? I'm in the militia and they look like madmen to me. And I know that some of that is true. But I also know that you cannot get up there and start spouting off that kind of stuff in that kind of situation. You cannot allow them to make a joke out of you by consenting to be on the Donovan Show, the great communist with the microphone who can make you look like an idiot. These are fools. You don't do that. You don't do that. You must maintain your dignity and your respect, and whatever you say to the press and to the nation must be words that will be taken seriously and respected and will build the respect and the dignity of the militia. Must. See, they're just waiting for the fools to come along to make jokes out of them. The only other legitimate person who ever spoke for the militia during any of this time on any public media was Linda Thompson, who is, by the way, the Judge Advocate General for the unorganized militia of the United States of America, not self-appointed. And when she spoke, she said the right things. Then they would try to make her look like an idiot, and, and sometimes they succeeded. Can you say anything to the press that's going to be put on camera or put on tape or film and expect to be treated fairly? No. What are they going to do with it? They're going to edit it. They're going to take one or two words out of context. They're going to make you look like a raving, blithering idiot. And you don't have to be in the militia for them to do that to you. They'll do that to you anyway. So what's the rule? Don't talk to the press. Don't let them put you on camera. And I'll go one step further. If they insist upon sticking that camera in your face, you stick your fist through their lens. 
You might get a few cuts, but by God, that delivers a pretty powerful message. Get out of my face. No, I'm not going to talk to you. Get your camera out of here. And they are the biggest liars, biggest lawbreakers you ever saw. They'll barge right in your front door. Unlawfully, they don't have any right to barge in your house, do they? They'll do it. Right after the bombing in Oklahoma City, I must have been called by well over 500 different reporters, TV stations, communist news networks, ABC, NBC, CBS, Donovan, everybody in the world called me. And I had three words for all of them. Go, Go blank yourself. That's what I told them. <laughs> Every one of them. Right. Now, do you think any single one of them quoted me? <laughs> Not one of them quoted me or even mentioned my name. But they all wanted to talk to me because they know that I'm the director of intelligence for the largest militia in the country. And they know that I speak for an awful lot of people. So they were just itching to get me on tape so they could destroy me. So, the lesson from that is when you do talk to the press, tell them something they will not quote. <laughs> yes, sir? Uh, you would have to ask an easy question. I first learned about Mark Kornke in 1989. The end of 1989. First couple of months of 1990. When he called my friend Stan Barrington, who was then working with me and helping me, and told Stan Barrington that he was an active duty officer of the Air Force Office of Special Investigation and he had material that he wanted to give us to leak to the American public. I was in the Office of Naval Intelligence. I know there's no leaks. So right away, I told Stan, I said, don't take anything from this guy because this is BS. And ask him to furnish us with proof of his identity. Substantiate himself. So we gave him that message, or Stan gave him that message, and he sent us Waco, or not Waco, but America Under Siege or something, some videotape. This was a long time ago. And he promised us that he would send documentation that he was who he said he was. Well, he never did. He contacted us again, we repeated our demand, and he never sent us anything. Next thing I know, a couple of years have passed, and I see him on a videotape, and he's saying that he was a member of the Army Intelligence Corps, and uh, that he, he was telling all these things on this videotape. Some of it was true, some of it was not true. You have to understand, folks, you cannot function as a provocateur or a disinformation agent without throwing some honey for the flies together. They have to speak some truth. They can't just put out all lies. So part of what Mike Kornke, or Mark Kornke says is true. Most of what he's ever said has been a lie. And if you go through his videotapes and his speeches and you check it all out, you'll find that out. I don't have to tell you that. And, and it really bothers me when you ask me these kinds of questions because all you have to do is research what they say and you'll find out that it, most of it's not true. You don't have to ask me those things. And that's what I try to instill in you. If you do this religiously, investigate what people say, you will soon find out what is truth and what is not true and who's speaking it and who's not. Overnight, listen to me, because this is true and a lot of you are falling into this stuff. 
over 95% of every piece of information that's passed through the community patriot, community uh, nationwide, is fake, false, lies, rumor, frauds, forgeries. It's the truth. But you see, you get this stuff, whether it comes over by fax, or you hear it on the radio, and you just pass it along, not realizing you're hurting all of us when you do that. You can't pass on anything without investigating it. You cannot do that. If you're passing on false, phony, fraudulent, forgery, fake lies, what are you doing? You're helping our enemies, aren't you? Do you know that most people have left the patriot community and stopped being patriots because of the bullshit that has gone through their hands that they have ultimately found out to be fake? Somebody came up a while ago and asked me about the Tommy Buckley Treasury Gate thing. I said on the radio, it was a fraud to begin with and it's a fraud now. And most of these people who call themselves patriots bought right into it, hanging on every word. Do you really believe in your wildest dreams that somebody came over from Indonesia and just bumped into Tommy Buckley on the street and gave him a bank certificate worth trillions of dollars? Are you nuts? And he's going to cash this thing and... Uh, in the meantime, he's collecting all his support and money and selling all this information and everything. Come on, people, wake up. It doesn't even pass the common sense test. My grandmother would have grabbed him by the ear and kicked him out of the house the minute he opened his mouth. How can people buy into this stuff? How? How can you fall for it? I don't understand it. And there's thousands of other ones. When I say keep your eye on the sparrow, I mean it. Don't get off of these cul-de-sacs chasing will-o'-the-wisps and ghosts and phony gold certificates and thinking you're going to get rich. If you get rich, it'll be because you worked for it, you were doing the right thing, and God supported you. And that's the only way you're going to get rich. Not because some guy came from Indonesia, bumped into some other dude on the street and said, oh, you look like a nice guy. I'm going to give you all these trillions of dollars. All you got to do is collect it. Yep, see you later. Send me a letter. Let me know what happens. Bullshit. I mean, how far gone can people be? It ain't so. Now let me say this again, 95% of everything that passes through your hands if you're in the Patriot community is bullshit, false, fake, phony, fraud, forgery, lies. If you want to take me to task on that, you pile up everything you collect for the next five months and bring them to Arizona and we'll sit there and we'll go through it and investigate every single piece of paper you've got. And if I'm not right, I'll eat the whole stack right in front of you. Because I've already done this many times. Yes, baby. <laughs> Give her some water, Annie. <laughs> so please, don't do that. I promised you I'd show you the Zap Ruder film. How many of you have never seen the real Zap Ruder film in fantastic color? from a first generation copy. Okay, you're gonna see it now. Bill, yes, sir. There was an article in our California that, that's an archive now. He took it over, it's so deteriorated it can't be shown again. And uh, taxpayers have to buy that film, they don't know what the value is from this guy. <laughs> well, years ago, when I got tired of wondering what was really on it, because I saw so many copies that were doctored and tampered with and, and were in black and white instead of color, and I knew the thing was originally taken in color, I started putting out feelers. I wormed my way into the corporation that had the, co the original 
copy of the Zepruder film. And it cost me $16,000, but I got a first generation 35 millimeter color copy directly off the original. So. The only reason why I've said anything is kind of coincidence, you know, it was in the paper yesterday, yesterday's Bakersfield, California, and I'm going to get to see it now. That's, that's kind of a Yep, you're going to get to see it right now. Yes. I don't blame him. Mm -hmm. And I'm really upset, not because I think I want to trust Bo, but because it appears that there's a conflict there, and I don't understand why it's there, and I'd like to know. Well, then let me ask you something. If I went and spoke to Mormons and told them that I was a Mormon, went to spoke to Christians and told them I was a Christian, went and spoke to atheists and told them that I had tried all the religions and couldn't find one that I belonged to, you think there's anything wrong with that? Is that... In a no, there's a lot more than that, but that's enough. Just that alone is enough. If it's not enough for you, I don't know what to say, but it's more than enough for me. But there's much, much more than that involved. Well, see, I don't know anything about it. What I heard from him and you today is about all I've heard. And I don't know where to go for any more information except to ask somebody. Investigate. One place to start is get all of his tapes and start listening to them and remembering what he says and find out how he changes his story from day to day. Well, I see a little of the switching up on religious things. I've, I've heard some of that. There's a lot more than that. When, the, uh, when, they, when they gassed the Branch Davidians, Bo Greitz went on radio, and he said, what they did is against the law. It's against the laws of war. We weren't allowed to use CS gas in Vietnam. It's a lie. I had CS gas on my boat, was issued to me, used it to break off engagements. And then, go get his book, Call to Serve. In his book, he tells a story about how he used CS gas in Vietnam, but yet he lied on the radio to the American people. Is that enough? I mean, I could go on for hours. Now, you heard him say that on the radio, didn't you? Go read his book. He also said a lot of things. He accused me, in his book, of stealing the Zapruder tape from a guy named Lars Hansen. He accused me of doing that and making a profit on the Zapruder tape. I have the radio broadcast where me and Bo Greitz were both on the same radio show with Billy Goodman, and I have played this on my radio broadcast in his own voice. A caller asks, well, Mr. Cooper, if you have the Zepruder film, why won't you make it available to the public? And you know what I said right on the radio show, and it's right there on the tape. Because of copyright restrictions, I don't want to infringe on anybody's copyright, and I don't know who this belongs to. Greit says, well, if Mr. Cooper doesn't want to make it available, I'll make it available. Just write to me and send me $10, and I'll send you a copy of the Zepruder tape. And he started sending them on everybody all over the world for 10 bucks a piece. That's the truth. And if you want a copy of the tape of that broadcast, I'll be happy to send you a copy. The truth is, Greitz is one of the most chronic liars I've ever run into in my life. And anybody that lies cannot be trusted. He has an agenda that is not good for us. And there's many, many, many more incidents. But, you know... Just the fact that he changes his religion depending on who's talking to is enough for me. I gave you two more after that. Do you need a hundred more? <laughs> if you do, I can give them to you. Yes, sir. Yeah, that's right. Tex Mars was a big supporter and fan of Bogreitz until he found out Bogreitz was lying. And, and he printed his, in, in his newsletter. <laughs> you know, it doesn't make me feel the good to get up here and talk like that about somebody. It doesn't. Believe me. And I'm going to tell you something else. I was one of the biggest fans and supporters of Bogreitz that he ever had in his life until I found out he was lying. Pardon? No. This 
Got other stuff to do. Got other fish to fry here. You're welcome. Let me tell you something. What most people get caught up in with Bo Greitz is the uniform. You see, take your eyes off the uniform. Look at the person and listen to what the person says. There's a human being in there. It's not the uniform. If he said that he resigned his commission, which he has said, why is he wearing the uniform? If he resigned his commission, how come he's got an officer's rank on his shoulders? What's going on here? Okay, uh, Doyle, can you come up here and give me a hand, please? <clears throat> I need you all to get in a position where you can see this screen really well. And I don't know where that's going to be for you, so you have to determine that for yourself. Yeah, we are. That's what Doyle's coming up for. If you can help me move this table back there, I guess. And I don't know how to operate that thing, so I'm going to have to ask you to do that. And I will step down here and use my trusty little laser. How many seconds is this going to last? How many seconds? Just a few seconds. It's just a few seconds, that's right, but you're going to see it over and over again. I'm going to let you see this over and over and over again. Now we need to kill the lights up here so you can see the screen really good. And I don't know how you do that. There you go, that's good. Okay. Pardon? You want me to go forward or just let it go on film? Uh, just let it go. I don't remember how long this test pattern's on here, but don't take your eyes off the screen because it starts like quick. And it's only a few seconds long. The first is going to be at the, uh, the normal speed, which you've never seen it at. For years, every time you've seen it on television or anywhere else, you've seen only portions of it, and you've seen it at a much greater speed than what, it, what really happened. So here, what you're going to see is the actual, real speed of the motorcade. This is the best that it ever gets, folks. There are no frames missing. Nothing. Now, if you miss something, don't worry about it, because you're going to see it over again. No, she didn't get anything. There was nothing on the, tr on the trunk of that car. She was trying to get out of there is what she was trying to do. Okay, you're going to see it again. This time we slow it down. Now what you're going to notice is these motorcycles come ahead of the motorcade and then they come down here and stop. Now this is really weird because that's not supposed to happen. This was made on Kodachrome film with an 8 millimeter camera, handheld by Abraham Zapruder. And the frames on those kinds of cameras, the shutter speed was about 1 30th of a second. So almost every frame is blurred. You're seeing every single frame is here. Nothing is missing. It's all here. Right about in here is where Kennedy was shot in the throat. See that umbrella? That's the umbrella man, lower left corner. You see that he's holding his throat. Jacqueline really doesn't know what's the matter. She knows something wrong, but she doesn't know he's been shot yet. No. There was no bullet that hit Kennedy that hit Connolly too. There's too much. Yeah. Now, if you'll notice here, look at this. 
Somebody has scraped the emulsion off the film on Kennedy's head so you cannot see the true nature of the wound. Jacqueline goes to get out of that car. There's nothing on the deck that isn't supposed to be there. There are radio antennas, there are handholds for the Secret Service, but there's nothing else. We've blown it up and examined it centimeter by centimeter. There's nothing. And she doesn't pick up anything. Notice that car blocking the underpass? It doesn't move until Kennedy's limousine almost runs into the back of it. That car belonged to the chief of police of Dallas Police Department. Dan Rather was, uh, I forget where Dan Rather was, but he was there. Yeah, he was by the overpass. Pardon? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Yes. <laughs> this is even slower, so you can see it. What you're seeing is frame by frame. Now I'm going to point out to you how this film's been altered. Either to make us believe that the bullet that killed Kennedy was fired from the front seat of the car, or to hide the fact that it was fired from the front seat of the car. We don't know which. But I will tell you this, while I was attached to the Office of Naval Intelligence on Admiral Clary's briefing team, I saw top secret documents that said that President Kennedy was shot in the head. The head shot was administered by the driver of the limousine whose name is William Greer. No, William Greer's dead. He's dead now, yes. Died of, supposedly died of cancer. Now you can see some black stuff go across this sign. It's where Abraham Zapruder stopped the film and then started it again. And during the processing, uh, some of the uh, chemicals used to process the film were not washed off the film properly. It's not, a, it's not something someone did to the film. You've probably seen the same thing on some of your home movies and 35 millimeter film that you get back from the lab. You'll see the famous umbrella in the lower left of the uh, picture as the right edge of the sign comes. That's what I was talking about there. And there's another one too. Those are processing glitches. This film was processed really quick after the assassination by a local lab in Dallas. given to Abraham Zapruder and then later was confiscated by the uh, government who took it to the National Photographic Lab in Washington DC and that's where I believe all the alterations to the film were made. Nobody gives up stuff like this willingly to anybody. <laughs> this is history, this is valuable. Nobody gives this kind of stuff up willingly. There's the umbrella. Right there. See it? Now, you can see Kennedy holding his neck. You can see Agent Kellerman, who is the passenger, watching Kennedy in the rearview mirror. See him? He's looking in the rearview mirror. The driver actually slows the car down almost to a complete stop against the normal training for Secret Service agents who are supposed to immediately, once an ambush occurs on the president or any senior government official, is supposed to speed up and get the car out of what's called the kill zone and protect the lives of the occupants of the 
car who are supposed to get down on the floor and stay there. Now watch up here. Now, when you blow this up and look at it closely, you'll see that the emulsion has been scraped off the film all up here in the front of this car. And it's, there you can see where a bullet hit the window. Or at least they want us to believe that the bullet hit the window, one of the, one of the two. The film has had extensive work done to it that you could never see before we actually got a copy and could blow up. You can't digitize something like this and look at it. You have to have film. So that's why we got a 35 millimeter f uh, uh, positive made directly off the 8 millimeter original. So what we have is, is as good as you can get. You can't get better than this from any source. I don't know, because there's, there's some real bad stuff going on here. The wound to his throat wasn't very deep. It didn't go in very far at all. You could probably stick, you know, two knuckles of this finger, and that was the extent of the throat wound. Didn't even go into his, his trachea or, or his esophagus. And the wound in the back was below the, the uh, scapular, or the shoulder bones, and you couldn't even stick one knuckle in there. It was only a half an inch deep. So what kind of a shot makes wounds like this? And there were no bullets taken out of either, two, either of these two wounds. So the, the theory that the, the, the bullet hole in his back, the bullet entered his back, went up, and, and did a Z thing, and then came out his throat and, and went and, and hit Connolly and, and uh, went through his wrist and his leg and then, you know, all over the place. It's total baloney. The wound in Kennedy's back was only a half an inch deep. The wound in his throat was only about maybe an inch and a half deep. It did not go anywhere. No, he could have, the first two would not have killed him, no. They were not even life-threatening. Painful maybe, yes. It was the head wound that killed Kennedy. And whatever hit him in the head literally blew his head into pieces. I think Jacqueline seen the driver do it, and that's why she was trying to get out of the back of the car. I think she believed her husband was shot by somebody in that car. And, and to tell you the truth, I believe that also. I believe that he was shot in the head by someone in that car, and that she was trying to get out of that car. And they never established No. Pardon? Colony. Governor, Governor Connolly and his wife. Connolly has also made some very cryptic statements. He said that when he fell back, when he was wounded and he fell back on top of his wife, he saw and felt the shot that hit Kennedy in the head. Now how can you see and feel that shot unless it's right over your face? I don't, I don't believe that. I don't believe that rumor because I've investigated all of this for many years and I've never even heard anything like that. And you have to understand the loyalty of the people in these great families. They don't do that. They don't do that. They just don't do it. It would be uh, suicide <laughs> to do it. Cut yourself off and your children off. Pardon? Nobody really knows. 
The question is, why was he killed? Nobody really knows why he was killed. There's a lot of conjecture that he signed a bill authorizing the printing of United States notes backed by silver and all kinds of stuff. Nobody knows why he was killed. Nobody knows. Some people are saying he was killed because he was going to bring the troops out of Vietnam. Other people say he was killed because he was uh, bucking the New World Order. The truth is, nobody really knows, and anything is just conjecture. Anything that I might offer to you, or that you might think, is just conjecture. But no one knows. No one knows. <coughs> well, once they killed John F. Kennedy, they pretty much had to kill his brother if they thought he was going to be elected president. Because what would be the first thing that he would do once he was elected president? He would open up the investigation and find out who really shot his brother. So they pretty much had to kill him. They couldn't allow a, his brother to become president. Sirhan Sirhan was just a patsy. We, we know who shot Robert Kennedy. It was the security guard named Caesar who shot him at point blank, put the gun right next to his head, right behind his ear, and shot him. That's who killed Robert Kennedy. We know that. Everybody knows who killed Robert Kennedy. Sirhan Sirhan is a scapegoat. And the security guard just disappeared. Sirhan Sirhan never got close to Robert Kennedy, but the death wound was right here. Barrel on the skin. In this film here, Bill, it makes sense she had John F. Kennedy's head in her hands. And when that blast and the bullet went past, she was literally holding him when his head exploded. Yeah. And that's why she's... Yeah, see this stuff back here? These are antennas. Those are antennas. These are handholds for the Secret Service. There is nothing on the deck of that, of, of that uh, limousine at all. Nothing whatsoever for her to grab. There is blood. There's blood all over everything. You can't blow somebody's head off without getting blood all over everything. Now the guy that jumps up and gets her to go back in there is uh, Hill, who was her Secret Service. You see this tail light here? This has been opaqued. That's a photographic technique for blocking the transmission of light through the emulsion. That brake light was really on. There's just opaquing over it. That's, where, that's one of the places where the film's been tampered with. There are several places. One is the right rear brake light has been opaqued. You can see the other one is on. The wounds on Kennedy's head after he's shot, the emulsion was scraped off the film, and there's emulsion scraped off the film all over the front of the front seat of the car where these two guys, Agent Kellerman and Greer, are doing things. The emulsion's just been scraped off. <coughs> this is the... Uh, was Kellerman also good? Uh, I don't remember if, if he is or not. Doyle? Where's Doyle? Yo, Doyle. Can we fast forward this to Dealey Plaza? I want to show them what's in Dealey Plaza. Is there some significance to that umbrella that you kept in We believe there is, but we don't really know and nobody can prove it. You see, as soon as Kennedy was shot in the throat, the umbrella opened. Now, if you have any experience with intelligence operations, that's a signal. That's saying, hey, he was hit. It's a signal. It's not odd at all if you understand these things. In a crowd, if you're going to have a signal, you've got to have a signal that will not be missed, which means it has to be an unusual thing that, that happens. And big enough for everybody taking part to see. You see, if you're going to try to assassinate a president, once you hit him, you can't stop there. So that's the signal that it's got to continue. We've got to kill this guy. He's been hit. We can't let him live because he'll track us down for the rest of his life. You know? So that's what we believe that it was. Now don't go out of here and tell people that I said that's what it is. That's what we believe that it is. It fits. 
We don't really know. A guy came into Congress during the hearings and said that he was the guy with the umbrella and he was just opening the umbrella to protect himself from the sun. The guy that went to Congress is not the guy that was standing there with the umbrella. The guy that was standing there with the umbrella is Gordon Novell. I know Gordon Novell. Gordon Novell is also one of the guys that was caught, who broke in to an office in New Orleans connected with the Kennedy assassination, was stealing information and, and you know. And if you read uh, Garrison's material, you'll know that Mark Lane, how many of you have heard of Mark Lane? <laughs> Mark Lane's been connected with the CIA all his life. Mark Lane was the, remember Jonestown? Who was the minister? Jim Jones. Guess who was his lawyer? Mark Lane. Jonestown thing was a CIA mind control experiment. And that congressman got onto it? That congressman got onto it. He went down there to investigate it. They murdered him. You know, Bo Bright said that too, that it was a mind control It was. Remember what I told you about flies and honey? Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, well, is, is that the beginning of the... Uh, it starts like a plaque. Yeah, that's it, okay. This is Dealey Plaza. This is a plaque dedicated to a man named Dealey who was a <laughs> 33rd degree Freemason of the southern jurisdiction of Scottish Rite. Dealey Plaza is built upon the site of the first fraternal lodge in the state of Texas. Remember, they always do things according to symbology and ritual. <coughs> that's old Mr. Dealey. This is the intersection of Main Street and Houston. Those cars are coming, are going up and down Main Street. The cross street is Houston. Now the quickest and most economical way for Kennedy to get to his next speaking engagement would have been to go straight down Main Street. He didn't. Came to this corner, made a right turn. Went to the next corner, made a left turn on Elm Street. What's significant about Elm Street? It's close to the 33rd parallel, which is one of the rituals in the, in the, in, in the history of these people. Guess what that is? That's the parking garage where Lee Harvey Oswald was killed. It all took place in Dealey Plaza. This is, these are, this is what they never tell you. It all took place in Dealey Plaza. There's the obelisk. Screw you. There it is. Big as life, just like I've always been telling you. And what's on top of that obelisk? The signature of the philosophers of fire, the eternal flame. How about that? If you count the blocks in the obelisk, there's 14. What's the significance of 14? It's the number of pieces into which Osiris's body was chopped and scattered about the, the country before Isis went and tracked it down and through this mystical intercourse became pregnant with the child Horus. A lot of you are scratching your heads and looking up at the ceiling. What the hell is he talking about now? It's all significant, folks. Osiris represents the sun. <coughs> the sun is the manifestation of the power of God. What is God in the mysteries? The intellect, right? Fire is the symbol of the intellect. These are known as the philosophers of fire. Osiris is the representation of the doctrine. 
Isis, see, first fraternal lodge. Isis is the representation of the church. Isis is the feminine. Osiris is the masculine. The sun being masculine. The moon being the feminine, reflecting the pure light of her master. Doesn't the church reflect the doctrine? And through this mystical union of the church and the doctrine is produced the child Horus, which is the full body of initiates of the secret fraternity of Illuminati. Secret order. Pardon? My brother-in-law is big in the Freemasonry. He wouldn't like this. No, he wouldn't like it because I'd be exposing what he's involved in. No. No, the, the highest degree in the Scottish Rite is the 32nd degree. The 33rd degree is a meritorious or honorary degree bestowed upon certain individuals. Okay? And... Uh, once you're a 33rd degree Freemason, then you can go into the, uh, the rites of, of Mizraim, which is another 63 degrees. Then after you reach that, then you can go to the OTO, which is the Ordo Templi Orientalis. Is it possible to be a 32nd degree Mason and not know how... No. Nope, they're told at the 30th degree. When they reach the 30th degree, they're told. They know. If they tell you they don't know, they're lying to you. And they have to lie because they've taken oaths to keep it a secret. They can't tell you the truth, even if it's your father, they've sworn. They can't tell you the truth, ever. Pardon? It's 96th degree is the highest that the rites of, of Mithra go. And then from there you go to the OTO for another nine degrees. That's the highest. Well then that means he's gone beyond thir uh, 96, which would put him into OTO. Art Bell, are, are you kidding? Do you listen to the Art Bell show and you're asking me if he's putting out disinformation? <laughs> you guys mind if I say a little prayer? <laughs> Please, Lord. Pardon? Shriners, you have to have attained the highest uh, degree of the Scottish Rite of Freemasonry or the York Rite which in the York Rite I think is the 13th degree and in the Scottish Rite is the 32nd degree. At the highest levels, yeah. I believe, I'd have to check to make sure. I, I don't remember the exact number of degrees in the York Rite, but it's much less than the Scottish Rite. Earl Warren's a 33rd degree Freemason. Gerald Ford's 33rd degree Freemason. But Earl Warren, you know, during the Warren Commission, he came from Bakersville. His father was murdered. And the chief of police of Bakersville, that was his only suspect, was his own son. Is that Chief Grayson? Chief Grayson. What are we seeing? This is the corner of uh, Maine and Houston. I've got to concentrate on this, folks, because there's things you've got to, to know about. So save your questions for later. This is the corner of Maine and Houston. This is the old courthouse over here. It's very old. But you're going to see some revealing things here in a minute. See, that's Houston Street. Here we go. Throughout history, these, these orders have been known as the, the Brotherhood of the Snake, the Brotherhood of the Dragon. 
There's the dragon. That's not a griffin, that's a dragon. That is the symbol, and you'll see this in ancient books and writings. This is the symbol of the Brotherhood of the Dragon. That's Scott Becker. He ran the Becker Satellite Network. We went to Dallas together to do this. What year? God, I don't remember. Long time. 1992, I believe it was. Scott's a character. I really liked him a lot. But he, when it came to do business, he <laughs> wasn't too hot. These are the sheeple who walk through Dealey Plaza every day <laughs> and don't see a bleeding thing. Don't see any, look at this. There's Osiris, the doctrine. There's Isis, the church, reflecting the pure light of her master. This reflection points directly to the sixth floor window. Also, it's on the sixth floor. Did you notice in the building the sixth floor window is the only square window in the building? Yep. Who is fond of claiming that when he raised his arm to the square? <clears throat> Isn't that what they put on Kennedy's grave? My, my. Insult, they're laughing at us. They laugh at us all the time. They rub it in our faces and laugh because we're so silly, so stupid. <clears throat> now what, is, what are these columns and pillars over here? And they're on the other side of the street Likewise, they're the quarters of the round stone temple of the sun, just like at Stonehenge. Dealey Plaza is a temple of the sun for the mystery religion of Babylon. Kennedy was killed on Elm Street. Elm Street is where traditionally they have posted the notice. It is also a grove. The sacrifice was always committed in a grove up on a stone altar when the sun had reached its zenith. When Kennedy was shot, it wasn't 12 noon, but on that latitude, the sun was directly overhead. Don't believe me? Look at all the shadows in the Zapruder film. If you want to see a representation of what happened in Dealey Plaza, watch The Lion King. When the brother, Scar, takes the little cub, puts him on a rock, under an elm tree, in a valley, at high noon, and then the hyenas start the stampede of the animals toward him. He was to be sacrificed upon that rock, under the elm. Nightmare on Elm Street. They laugh at us all the time. It's hilarious. Now let me tell you something. They say that Kennedy was shot from the grassy knoll by an assassin with a high-powered rifle with a scope on it. How many of you are hunters? How many of you have used a rifle with a scope? How many? Okay. For Kennedy to have shot, for uh, anyone to have shot Kennedy with a rifle, with a scope on it, from the grassy knoll, simply impossible. Why? Does anybody know why? Too close to the target. The hell you need a scope for? By the time you found his head in the scope, he would have been gone. Every rifleman knows that. <laughs> Scope is only for long distance shooting. From that grassy knoll, I stood there 
And I'm going to tell you, from that grassy knoll to where Kennedy was shot in the head was about from here to the corner of that wall right there where the plant is. So, when they tell you that he was shot by a rifleman using a scope on a rifle, I don't care if it's high powered or 22, it's no. No, no, no. No professional assassin would ever have chosen that place to shoot his target moving from left to right directly in front of him at that close of a range under any circumstances. Wouldn't do it. Just simply wouldn't do it. It's not done. Anybody who would do that is not a professional. Would never have been hired or contracted to do the job. Period. The best place to shoot a moving target from is where? Directly ahead or directly behind or in the vehicle up close. Which is the sure thing? In the vehicle up close. Oop. Everybody close your ears. Scott is going to say an obscenity here. No, no. Shut up, Scott. <laughs> I forgot about that. I just remembered it. So we found this place. It goes right down into the sewer. And there's another hole right down in there where you can go down and disappear forever. How long have been there? It's been there forever. And that's the view from the hole. It's not a good shot either, is it? And there were more trees and, and other things there on the day Kennedy was shot that are now gone. No, you couldn't get any lead. And when the car presented itself, it would have been like abrupt, sudden. It's not a good shot either. And this is, uh, goes right down in the sewer. Just lift up that plate and wiggle down through that hole and you're gone. Okay, uh, Doyle, yep. can we take this one out and put the one in that has no sound? <laughs> the, the, remember the one you had in first? Yeah, I'll stick that in. Yes? You're going to see, I'm going to show you. Yes. I have no idea. I don't think he was supposed to be shot. When he was, when he was uh, shot, you know what he said? He said, oh my God, they're going to kill us all. Which tells me he knew it was going to happen. He knew it was going to happen. Well, no, I think that was Lyndon. <laughs> Lyndon didn't want to ride in the car. Lyndon wasn't too fond of Lyndon wasn't too fond of uh, JFK. Connolly didn't want to ride in the president's car if he was going to have a bad reception. <laughs> but he actually had a good reception. Okay, yeah. Back that up. Okay, pay attention to this, folks, because you, you can see everything here. Here is Dealey Plaza. You can see it's laid out in the truncated pyramid of the Temple of Initiation of the Mysteries. The capstone is missing. There are actually three triangles here. One, uh, actually three uh, pyramids here. One big one, one and two small ones. There are three eyes over the pyramids uh, that are the underpasses under the railroad overpass. This is Main Street here, 
They took a right turn, went down here and turned left on Elm Street, it was shot in the throat here, supposedly shot in the back here, shot in the head and killed here. Three shots, three wounds. That's six. There's the sixth floor. All of this is in the, the tremendous symbology of the mysteries. Now, here's the kicker. Where was he hit? And it also explains why these two wounds were weird. In the Masonic initiation, Hiram Abiff is attacked and hit in the back or the chest, this torso area, the throat, and in the head. Exact same wounds suffered by Kennedy. Where'd you get the footage of the overhead the helicopter shot? Pardon? Where'd you get the helicopter shot that they just showed? From a helicopter. <laughs> did you do that yourself? We did that. But uh, can we back that up, Doyle? Where'd you go? Don't go away. I need you. <laughs> I need you, Doyle. Isn't it nice to be needed? Yeah. I'm that color. Man. Need to back that up to that. Uh, what you call it? I want to point out to you what all's in there. You can see the. Okay, look here. Over here, on, see this? This is part of the, t the Temple of the Sun. This is another part. Instead of all being together in one spot, they're separated. There's four of them. You put them together, it makes a stone temple just like Stonehenge. See up there? And anyway, that's what I want to show them. You can take that video out now and turn the lights back on. That's what I wanted you to see. That uh, Dealey Plaza is really an occult temple of the mystery religion of the so-called fraternal orders, which is really the ancient mystery religion of Babylon. And uh, Kennedy's assassination was a ritual assassination done in the temple when the sun was at its highest in the grove on a rock. He was the sacrificed king. And nobody really knows what the purpose of it was. <coughs> Excuse me. But the outcome was that it destroyed the political will of the nation. And it scared the hell out of everybody. If they can kill John F. Kennedy, they can kill anybody that goes against them. Isn't that a message? Who's safe from them? Oh, you're wrong. Anyone who is not afraid of them is safe from them. Not in that you're not going to be killed. You might be killed. But in that you are their most dangerous enemy. How many of you in here are Christians? If you're a Christian, what are you afraid of? I mean, serious. What are you? What is there to be afraid of? If they kill you, what happens? Go to heaven. Be with Jesus. So why are you afraid? So why aren't you doing what you know you should be doing all the time? Just getting in their face, telling them you're not afraid of them. I don't care if you kill me. I believe in God. I'm doing the right thing. You can't judge me. God can. Death is not bad. It's a transition to a better world, actually. Now, if you tell me you're a Christian and you're still afraid, what are you telling me? You're not a Christian. You're lying to yourself and you're lying to me. I don't care if you lie to yourself, but don't ever lie to me. Lie to yourself all you want to. Don't lie to me. If you're a Christian, you cannot be afraid. There's nothing that they can do to you, period, that is bad. Nothing. 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 
That's why I'm the most dangerous radio host in America. That's why I'm the most dangerous thing that's ever come along to these people in their entire history because I am not afraid of them. I don't care if they kill me tomorrow. I'm going to do as much damage to them and expose them for what they are for as long as I'm living. And you know what else? And in doing that, it sort of protects me because if they come along and kill me tomorrow, what are you all going to believe? You were right. That you were right. You know, I had some doubts, but now I know he was right. And so now they can't touch me. Now they can't touch me because of that. They've waited too long. They thought I was some silly little fool that would destroy myself somewhere along the way, and it hasn't happened. So now they back themselves into a corner. If they touch me now, in fact, I'll go one further. If I step out on my porch in the middle of winter and slip on the ice and my head cracks open as an accident, the whole world is going to know they killed me to shut me up. <laughs> and I was right all along. And that's why they come every window in winter and put salt on my steps. <laughs> yes, sir. That's great. That's great. And I would like you. I don't care. <laughs> you can't. You see, what is it when you're afraid of somebody? Let me, let me put it a different way that you will all understand. Let me bring it home to you. How many of you file and pay income tax? How many of you file that file and pay income tax know that you don't have to? Why do you file and pay income tax if you know you don't have to? No, it's because you're afraid. If you're afraid and you file and pay income tax and you know you don't have to, what are you doing? You're paying tribute to your master and you have admitted that you are the slave. And you are afraid, which means you're not a Christian. No matter who you tell you are, no matter what church you go to, no matter how you try to convince anybody, you know in your heart you're not. Because if you are, you cannot be afraid. And that's something you have to deal with for yourself. I'm not saying this to embarrass anybody or make anybody feel bad. I'm saying it because we have to learn to live with the truth. Whatever the truth is, no matter who it hurts or helps, even if it hurts me. See, I had to start with these same things too. And I had to do some real reckoning here with myself before I could get up here and try to reckon with you. I couldn't do it if I hadn't reckoned with myself first. And neither can you. You can't fight this battle if you're afraid of the enemy. He's already beaten you if you're afraid. You're whipped. You're finished. You can't fight the battle if you're afraid of the enemy. You can't do it. If they walked in here right now and put a gun to my head and said, we're going to shoot you, unless you say this, this, or this, I'll say shoot. Shoot. Go right ahead. Pull the trigger. And I'd look them right in the eye. And they can pull the trigger if they want to. And that's the truth. Because I'm not afraid. See, I believe in God. And I've learned in my life that if I'm doing the right thing, God's going to take care of me. And death is what? It's a transition. They can't kill me. All they can do is set me free from this body. That's all. And isn't that the ultimate freedom? Isn't it? And who loves freedom more than anybody in this room? Me. <laughs> so they can't hurt me. They can set me into another state of freedom. And if I've been doing God's work, God's going to smile at me and open the gates, and I'm going to get some rest. And it's going to feel good. You know? Whether there's really gates or that's just a metaphor for something we pass through, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. I'm also an investigator. And that's going to be the ultimate research project. <laughs>
And if I can, I'll come back and tell you what the results are. <laughs> yes, sir. What is the status on the next issue of Veritas? It's being worked on right now. The paper has been laid out, and we're putting stories into it. Uh, and as soon as that's done, it'll go to press and be on the way to you. We've had some tremendous setbacks. We lost our staff. Then we had tremendous compute, uh, computer failures. And uh, what else happened? The, the new editor that we got, just his wife just recently had a baby, and that stopped everything again. You know how that is. Do you have a time estimate? No. No, I, I don't have a time estimate. And we foresaw these kinds of things happening because there's nobody. You know who really runs this whole thing? Annie and I. That's it. <laughs> And we're doing a tremendous amount of work that everybody else says they can't do because they're just one solid, lonely little person. So that's why we sold the paper by number of issues rather than per week or per month or per year or whatever. So that if we had these kind of things, we're not infringing upon breaking anybody's contract. We will deliver the number of issues that you have subscribed to. Maybe not as quickly as you would like it, but you will get them. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, yeah, beginning I think uh, about the 7th of May, we'll be going to one hour a day for as long as we can. If that doesn't work out, we'll cut down to even less than that. Pardon? No. And to tell you the truth, I haven't really been looking very hard. Swiss America was a great sponsor. They paid for the, uh, the satellite time for my show only and for the shortwave air time for my show only for four years. And uh, they're great people. Craig Smith is my good friend. But you have no conception of how much money that represents that he put into the backing of my show. I never took a penny from Craig. He never paid me anything. I never asked him for anything. In fact, the agreement was that if he ever paid me anything, the thing that it would be over because I don't want that. But he paid he put in to the to the payment of shortwave and satellite airtime probably three, four hundred thousand dollars easily. And the amount of business that he got back, if you want to know the truth probably cost him another three, four hundred thousand dollars <laughs> because, folks, uh, I probably lost him more customers than he ever gained from my broadcast because of the controversial nature and because of the fact that I, I'm just not the most polite person in the world to the socialists who might have been doing business with him. Yes? Pardon? No, I told him to take a flying, you know what. Oh, I sent in a, no, nothing. I sent in about uh, 500,000 Freedom of Information requests and got every piece of information that, uh, that you can possibly get from them about me and about them and how they operate and everything else. And I filed suit against them, which I'm winning. <laughs> and... Uh, they don't like me very much. Yeah. They've tried many ways to put me away forever. And it just doesn't work simply because, number one, I'm not afraid of them. Number two, I don't believe this thing that uh, the law is too hard for us to understand unless we're an attorney. And I go study the law. Whatever it is they're trying to pull on me, I go get in the law books and figure out what it's all about and I throw it back in their face. and. And they go limping away, usually, with their tail between their legs. Yeah? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Your position is they don't have any jurisdiction? They don't have any jurisdiction. I'm not required by any law to file or pay income tax, and I just flat will not do it. Last time an FBI agent came to talk to me, he asked me about income tax, and I said, I don't file, and I don't pay, and you can go back and tell your lackeys that I'm never going to file, and I'm never going to pay. 
No, I don't need to do that. I know what the law says. And the law says I'm not required. They don't care. They'll come get your They only don't care if you don't know the law. And if you don't know how to talk to them and can't represent yourself in court, then they don't care. You can win in court and they'll still come and tell your stuff. No, they won't. They won't tell my stuff. <laughs> and I'll tell you something else. I'll go even farther than that. The day that they ever try, I will defend myself, my property, and my family with a force of arms until I'm dead. And I don't care if they kill me. Let them explain that to the world. I don't think they want that to happen. They don't want to do that. It's hard to explain. Makes me right too, doesn't it? It's going to embarrass the hell out of them. And the whole world will see a man who's not afraid of them put his life on the line for his self, his property, and his family and stand up to him and die like a man on television. And the whole world will know that it was the right thing that I did. People know too much about me for the spin doctors to get a hold of it. That's why, you see, when the president names me in a White House memo as the most dangerous radio host in America, and Dan Rather's talking about the militia of Montana, what does that tell you about me? That I've got some power. They're afraid to even mention my name on the 6 o'clock news. I've got some power. And I know how to wield that power. I know who I am. I know how much power I have. And it's the power of information and knowledge. And they know that I'm not afraid and I will go to the wall to defend my rights. And they know that that's what every American is supposed to do. And they don't want anybody to see that. So, there you have it, in a nutshell. Really, that's what it's all about. If you're not afraid, and you have information and knowledge, you are powerful. I'm not unique, I just worked hard for this. I love my children. Believe it or not, I love your children. I love all children. I don't love all adults. <laughs> but I love all children. The future belongs to them. I'm going to do my best to make sure they have the best possible future they can possibly have. And if it's not good, nobody can ever put the blame on my shoulders. Nobody. The trust must. The trust is not a natural human. The trust is an artificial entity allowed and protected by the state. The trust has to file returns. Same for corporations. Same for corporations. Any artificial entity must file returns. It's as simple as that. But let me show you the neat part about it. <laughs> oh. Thank you. First time I've ever been piped aboard. <laughs> Let me show you the neat part of this. How many of you don't even know what a trust is? Don't be afraid to raise your hands. Okay, you need to find out. If you're interested in a trust, I'm going to tell you there's lots of them out there. Most of them you don't even want to get involved in. Most of them will hurt you. Most of them will not educate you properly. They give you a few pieces of paper, tell them if you fill them out and sign them and go file them here or there, that you've got a trust, and it's not true. It's a lie. And it'll get you in trouble, okay? If you really want to get into a real trust that is solid, and you're willing to do what's required, when you're required to do it, and before the expiration date, fulfill all the requirements of the trust, and faithfully, execute the paperwork and have the meetings of the trustees and all of these kinds of things, you can have a trust that will be iron bound, can't be broken, will protect your assets for your children for as long as they live, and it's going to cost you about $10,000. And you can't buy it from me. 
but I know where to send you. If you're interested, send me a letter and I'll send your name and address to the people who can do it for you right and who will guarantee the trust for you when it's done. But that's what it costs, $10,000. And they will train you and educate you and help you all along the way. Nobody else will do that. So if you're interested, write me a letter and let me know. Is it worth $10,000? You better bet your boots it is. Just the first year alone it's worth $10,000 because that's what you're going to pay in taxes without it. Everybody in here, you're going to pay taxes. Most of you are going to pay at least $10,000, maybe more. Hi, sweetheart. You want to come up here with me? Come on. <clears throat> so let me just demonstrate to you a little bit about a trust. Come on up here, honey. Come on, let me have your little hand. Give me your hand. That's it. You can come up here with Poppy. Okay? Oh, you want to talk? <laughs> Let, let me do this thing for everybody. What time is it? It's after 7. Okay, I'm going to do this real quick and then we're going to be finished, okay? And then I'll see you tomorrow at 1. In a trust, what you do is you have a family trust. Bill? Yeah. It's not going to cover anything we talked about today. It's going to be a lot of Area 51 stuff, a lot of, uh, a lot of slides. Mm -hmm. uh, Going to be, it's going to be really interesting is what it's, what it's going to be. Okay, this is a, a family trust. A family trust is where you take everything that you own or have ever owned and you put it in trust for the beneficiaries. Now here's where you get in trouble. The trustees can have no interest in this trust. Okay? So you have to designate beneficiaries. They should be your children. They don't have to be your children. It can be anybody. The way we have our set up is we have our children are the beneficiaries of the trust. Everything that we own has been relegated into the trust. We own nothing. I don't own this shirt. It belongs to my daughters. It's the truth. We own nothing. Ooh, what you got there? What in the world have you got? Annie and I are the trustees. We are the fiduciary agents of the trust. This trust has another trust, which is the business trust. This trust conducts all the business. The beneficiary of this trust is this trust. Okay? We also have four other trusts, all of which the beneficiary is this trust. This trust owns all our vehicles, automobiles, conveyances, whatever. This trust owns all firearms. And I mean owns them. We don't own them. If we want to use one of these vehicles, we have to lease it from this trust. If we want to use a firearm, we have to lease it from this trust for the period of time that we're going to use it for whatever purpose. This trust, I forget what's in this trust. This trust is, I forget what's in that trust too. <laughs> There's another trust over here, which is the charitable trust. Everything that's left over at the end of the year from all of these other trusts is donated to this trust and is tax deductible. Those trusts pay no income taxes. This trust is a charitable trust, nonprofit foundation, which pays no income taxes. But every year, 5% of what goes into this trust must go back to the community. This money does not belong to us. The library is in here. 101.1 FM is owned by the charitable trust. It's a community service radio station. Okay? It all goes to the community. This is how we give back to the community, to our country, to our fellow men, to our neighbors. It's not ours. We can't come and take anything out of here. If we need a loan, we can borrow money 
from this trust, but we have to pay it back. Annie and I as trustees are paid a salary by each trust for maintaining the trust. I get $25 a year for each trust. Annie gets the same. We enter into contracts with the trusts that the trusts will pay all of our expenses connected with the education, the rearing, the supervision of the beneficiaries of the trust and for managing the trusts. It's all legal, it's all lawful, it's all constitutional, it's all approved by the Internal Revenue Service. You cannot get in trouble, period. I don't earn enough money to even have to file an income tax return even if I wanted to at the end of the year. And if I did, I wouldn't and haven't for many years before we even did this when I made a lot of money. Okay? And my daughters are taken care of. If anything happens to us, these trusts are irrevocable perpetual trusts. They're pure trusts. New trustees would be appointed and they would have to manage the trusts and take care of the beneficiaries just as we have always done. The trusts are the guardians of our daughters, not us. Okay? And in that sense, the trustees actually become the legal guardians of the children. There are no estate taxes, there are no death taxes, there are no nothing. The trust didn't die. And it's all done through the Constitution, through our right to contract. And if you still don't believe it, this, what I've outlined for you, is called a complex trust. Next time you look at your 1040 information, look on there and you'll see complex trust. 1041, that's right. Yeah, Gary. The firearms, uh, the trust can actually buy a firearm, right? It has to be bought by a person who is individual. Well, we owned all of our firearms. But if we were to buy one today. If we were going to buy one today, we'd buy it as an individual and sell it to the trust. Absolutely, yes. For everything. Absolutely, yes. The family trust literally bought everything that Annie and I own for $10. Everything. We own nothing. And never will own anything. <coughs> now that's commitment. What do I need with anything? I happen to know from personal experience that if you fall in love with material things, if you can't turn your back on everything that you own and walk away right now, you're enslaved. That's right. yep. Literally, you are enslaved. I don't want anything. I don't need anything. And I gotta tell you, if our house was to burn down tomorrow and we lose everything that belongs to the trust, wouldn't bother me a bit. We start over. I, of course, would be concerned for the children losing part of their security to take care of them until they become old enough to quit being beneficiaries and become trustees because that's what the children ultimately become. They ultimately give up everything that they own also and become trustees. Now this is not frivolous, and this isn't funny, and it's not something that you do lightly because you truly don't own any of it, and the law says you must take care of it for the beneficiaries, and if you misuse it, or if you're a spendthrift, you're liable to go to jail for the mismanagement of your own trust. And that's exactly the way it should be. Because you see, none of this is ours anymore. It doesn't belong to us. We have a responsibility as fiduciary agents to take care of it in their name. It belongs to them. All of it. And everything that the trusts do, everything that's done by these trusts is for the betterment of the nation, of the American people. That's our mission statement. That's the purpose of the whole thing. 
Okay, thank you very much, folks. I hope to see you tomorrow. Good night, and God bless you. Ha, 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 ha.